On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law? Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus said. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped of him his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to be here with you. Um, we have, as you probably reading this text, looking at this text, have one of the most well-known passages in the Gospels. That's the story of Good Sam. Who doesn't know the story of Good Sam? The story that Jesus tells about a Samaritan man who helped a beat-up man on the side of the road. Now, that to say, the question that I think we have to ask ourselves as we approach this text is what was Jesus intending to say to us through the story? Um, the story really, for, for a lot of people, has become sort of an illustrative metaphor of extreme acts of sacrificial kindness. So in a lot of people's mind, this is a social justice passage. Um, we have uh, uh, titles that we call people based on this story. A societal hero in today's uh, age might end up in the newspaper called a good Samaritan, right? Or I think of Franklin Graham, the son of Billy Graham. He has a great uh, organization to serve the globe in acts of mercy called Samaritan's Purse. We have a law uh, called uh, the Good Samaritan Law, which protects a citizen who's going to do good on behalf of someone else. And if in the act you accidentally harm or even kill someone in trying to help them, the Good Samaritan Law will protect you. And so when we think about the story of the Good Samaritan, um, I think we have to ask ourselves, well, what was Jesus wanting to say to us through this story? Um, is the point of this passage about relieving human suffering? Is this about loving our neighbor and helping the stranger or caring for the downtrodden? Well, if we're going to answer that, I think we have to do what we need to learn how to do when we study scripture, and that is study in context. That is, let's recall to our minds the conversation that Jesus was having that led up to the telling of this story. Um, some people have called it the 2020 rule. Whenever you study scripture, a particular passage, you should read 20 verses before and 20 verses after, so you make sure you've got a little bit of context there. And so, you know, what was happening here is that Jesus was being confronted by what the NIV calls an expert of the law. Now, I, some of your translations might use the term lawyer. Out of curiosity, how many of you have a translation that uses the term lawyer? So lawyer um, is not like you're thinking lawyer, like in a courtroom lawyer, but in that day, it was, as the NIV translates it correctly, it was an expert in the law, the Mosaic, Rabbinic, Talmudic law. And so this expert of the law is sort of a, uh, we would call him a genius, a PhD, an overachiever, 
um, someone who's just brilliant, right? This is a person who's really applied themselves, and probably in the church we would call someone like this a scholar or a theologian. So now we've got in our mind's eye, we're talking about a sharp stick in the pile. We're talking about someone who's intellectually with it, um, someone who knows the law in and out, comes, verse 25, this expert in the law to do what? To test Jesus. He's trying to test God. Doesn't know he's God. And he tests him with this question, this very basic question in Judaism. That is, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Now, there's a big, broad question, and this was a question that was actually debated in Judaism all the time. What must we do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus, in his classic form, often when he would be caught in one of these controversial conversations with a religious person who was trying to entrap him or test him, Jesus had a way of, of turning the tables, of putting the ball back in their court. And, and really, as you start to unpack this story, you start wondering, who's really on trial, right? This lawyer or Jesus? Uh, Jesus has actually put the lawyer on trial. And he does so by answering his question with another question. Note, note verse 26, Jesus responds to the religious leader. He volleys back to him, well, what is then written in the law? What, teacher, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Now, you have to understand that this is a very elementary question for a guy like this expert in the law, a PhD. It'd be like the equivalent of you and I coming up to a, a PhD and saying, do you know your ABCs? Can you count to 10? They, just, they, wouldn't even want, they wouldn't even know what to do with a question like that. That's ridiculous. For Jesus to say, what does the law say, was the equivalent of saying to a PhD, do you know the ABCs? Because twice a day, Orthodox Jews would recite the statement that the lawyer makes. What, how does he answer it? Notice verse 27, when, when he says, when Jesus asks him, what does the law say? How do you read it? The lawyer says, as he would, uh, any Orthodox Jew would say twice a day, recite this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Because Jesus actually at one point quoted this in saying, this is on this, hang all the law and prophets. This was a very known statement to summarize the law. The first statement, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, is a quotation out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And the Hebrews called this the great Shema. Anything with a title like that is like really good, like just sounds good, the great Shema. And the great Shema, the word Shema, is the Hebrew word here. And it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Again, that Deuteronomy 6 passage, the great Shema, uh, it, it begins by saying, Hear, which is the word Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But that's where that ends. So, so Jesus asks him in this question that the lawyer is trying to test him with, how do we inherit eternal life? What does the law say? How do you read it? Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. But then he adds something else to it. He says, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. That's a quotation out of a different part of Torah. The book of Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18. And for those of you who are new to the Bible, the the Torah is simply first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So he says, this is the way the law is summarized. Love God with everything you are. And Leviticus 19, 18, we would call this the golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Why was the summation of the law pulled from, the summation of the Ten Commandments pulled from those two verses in Scripture? Well, here's why. Think of the Ten Commandments for a moment. How many of you guys have the Ten Commandments memorized? If you struggle memorizing the Ten Commandments, I have got help for you today. Welcome back to Sunday school. I learned this song, and I literally, to this day, when I'm trying to think about a commandment, I sing this song to myself. I'm not going to sing it, but I'll just tell you the words. 
It's called, <laughs> no, <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to Tony. Number one, we've just begun. God should be first in your life. It's called the perfect tense. Number two, oh, I said I know it by the, okay. Number one, we've just begun. God should be first in your life. Number two, the golden rule, those graven images aren't nice. Number three, God's name should be never spoken in jest. Number four, the Sabbath for worship and for rest. Number five, we all should strive to honor father and mother. Hey, number six, <laughs> number six, don't get your kicks from killing one another. Number seven, life is heaven when you're true to your mate. Number eight, don't steal and break this command for good. The baby's crying while I'm singing. <laughs> Did you pinch her? <laughs> get him to stop, Pippa. <laughs> Number eight, don't steal and break this command for goodness sake. Number nine, don't be the kind that goes around telling lies. Number ten, don't covet when you see your neighbor's house or wives. That's the list, and God insists we stay away from these sins. That is why we memorize commandments one through ten, the perfect ten. <laughs> I feel like William hung to uh, on American Idol. <laughs> I have no professional twinning at all. <laughs> dance. No, Casto, no. The Cuban dancer himself. Um, so he quotes from um, Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19, putting together the two tables of the law. The first table of the law, commandments 1 through 4, are vertical in nature. That is, there are how a man relates to God, right? Don't have any other gods before me. No graven images. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. So first four commandments, that's Deuteronomy 6. That's how we relate to God vertically. But the last six commandments, second table of the law, are the horizontal commandments. How we relate to our fellow man. And, and those commandments have to do with the way we treat our parents. Not murdering, not committing adultery, not lying, not coveting, not stealing, not bearing false witness. And, and so... Really, in this statement that the lawyer makes, this was summarizing the Ten Commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And at this point, basically, Jesus has just baited this expert in the law to admit that the law says to have eternal life, you've got to keep the law. Now, I don't, I don't know if that hits you like it hits me, but the thought that in order for me to have eternal life, I've got to perfectly keep the law. Jesus has basically got the lawyer to admit this. And, and then so, so he says, well, here, here's what we must do to have eternal life. This is what the law says. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And Jesus, classic response. He says, you've answered correctly. Now go do it. Uh, like that's easy. Go love God with everything you are at all times perfectly. And love all people perfectly. Just go do it. It'd be like if uh, Jesus said to you, the only way you're going to get to heaven is if you fly there. So go sprout wings and start flying. And you're like, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but uh, I can't do that. And, and this was all to get this man this, to the point, to this lawyer, to the point where he would fall on his knees, humble himself, and admit the fact that he couldn't do it. He hadn't done it. He wasn't capable of living this way at all times. But instead of being humble, the lawyer continues to press. Look at verse 29. Classic phrase. It says, he wanting to justify himself. So his motivation is self-justification. It's amazing the acrobatics we do as people to justify ourselves. So I have kids, so I get to watch this uh, at a very unsophisticated level. As adults, we become more sophisticated at justifying ourselves. But when, when your kids do it, they're not as sophisticated. So you get to see it for what it is. Like my son Silas, when he was like five, um, four or five, he had gone to the dollar store. Got a little toy from the dollar store. Mom bought it for him. Coming down for lunch. And when he was a little guy, he was like a little monkey. He would never let go of stuff he got. Our, our youngest justice is now like that. Everything that he gets like holds tight. And so he's got this little dollar store toy holding it in his hand. And my wife's like, you can't have that at the table. And, and so there was a big conflict, as you would imagine, five-year-old holding on to his little dollar store 
dollar, dollar store toy, and uh, he didn't want to let it go. And, and so he gets mad, and he, he called my wife a street rat. <laughs> and I just happened to be at the house when he said it. I was like, Silas, get up to your room. And I was busting up, but, you know, <laughs> had to compose myself. He just, Jenny, he just called. That's like the worst thing you can think of, right? Like, pretty sheltered kid, right? I mean, if that's the worst set of words you can come up with, street rat. <laughs> All right, I think we're doing a pretty good job keeping him from evil influences. So I sent him up to his room. So I go up there. I said, Sots, don't lie to me. What did you just call mom? And in his mind, he thought street rat sounds really bad. So I'm going to lessen what I said. And he goes, I called her a catfish. I was like, buddy, street rat and catfish don't even sound alike. You did not say catfish. He's like, I called her, I called her a wallaby called her a kangaroo. He's like, anything, he, and, and so I was like in there pressing for him to finally quit trying to justify himself until finally the moment of truth. Okay, I called her a street rat. But I wanted him to say, say you said street rat. So this lawyer is like caught, right? Like you just said that in order to, to inherit eternal life, you've got to fulfill the law perfectly, right? So now, how are you going to do this? And this man wanting to justify himself says, well, then who's my neighbor? Ah, <laughs> off on a technicality, right? Uh, found a loophole in the law. Well, who's my neighbor? Because in his mind, his neighbor was either a fellow Jew or a physically a neighbor, a friend, or a family member. And so he's thinking, well, according to my best friend Bob and my mom and my neighbor Joe, I'm a pretty good guy. And so he's thinking, I've got neighbor thing, loving neighbor, check. And so then Jesus breaks into this story of the Samaritan. And it's actually my opinion that the Good Samaritan story was Jesus' way of trying to dis derail this guy who thought he was doing good by the law. This man who thought, I'm a pretty good person, I've kept the commandments, I deserve eternal life. And so Jesus breaks into the story with that in mind. He, he starts telling the story to a man who thinks that on his own, apart from Jesus, he's doing okay. And Jesus seeks to derail, derail this guy. And, and, and remember the story of the Good Samaritan. I know you know this story, but remember, it's driven by the questions that this expert in the law asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And who's my neighbor? So Jesus starts in. Verse 30 through 36, he tells this story. There was a man. We don't know the man's nationality. He was probably Jewish. He was traveling on a notorious road from Jerusalem to Jericho. And this route, this route was infamous for robbers and thieves and criminals. It was actually known as the Pass of Adumim. And uh, it's talked about in the book of Joshua, a adumim means bloody or blood. So, so there was a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho on the bloody pass, known for robbers and thieves and criminals, and some hoods found him. And they beat him. They stripped him naked. Or as you would say in the South, naked. <laughs> they robbed him. They took everything from him. And this man is left as... Jesus tells the story half dead. He's got no clothes. He's got no money. He's got no strength. He's got no help of being able to help himself. And just when the story looks really dark, a man on a lonely road lined with caves on the bloody pass, the, the, the path of a doomim, notorious from Jerusalem to Jericho, this man left half dead on a road. Then all of a sudden the story brightens a little bit when you hear that one of the heroes in Israel was passing by, just so happened to be passing by. And now at this point you're thinking, if there is anyone in Israel who would be a hero in a story like this, it is the priest. Because the priests were the hero religiously 
in that era, that they were strict followers of Torah, and Torah said that you should love the stranger and care for the be- beaten and broken. And so I'm sure in the mind of this expert of the law and the listening audience are thinking, okay, the priest came. He's going to be the hero of this troubling story. But as you know, the priest, it says, he didn't just not do anything. He went on the exact opposite side of the road, or the Greek could actually render it. He turned around and went the opposite way. He didn't want anything to do with this beat up, broken man. He did not love the broken man. And so now you have an Israeli hero, a priest, a religious hero, completely put in a bad light. But now we've got a second opportunity because next down the road comes the Levite. Now, who's a Levite? He was a, a, a Jew from the tribe of Levi, but he was also the Levites were, were more likely temple servants. They were, if you would, they were church staff, right? So a pastor comes first, does nothing, and then one of the church staff members comes by. It's a Levite. But he, again, sees the beat up, broken man and does nothing to help him but actually goes on the side of the other side of the road, or more properly, he turned around and went the opposite direction. Now, what just happened here? In one fell swoop, Jesus attacked the Jewish religious system by saying the priest and the Levite did not fulfill the law. The priest and the Levite had no advantage as it concerns eternal life. In other words, to say your ethnicity as a Jew, your circumcision, your religious standing as a priest or a Jew doesn't mean that you're guaranteed eternal life. But then Jesus throws the clincher, the shocker, the turn in the story, that part in the movie where you thought you kind of had the plot figured out and then everything turns and goes the other direction because enter a Samaritan. The Samaritan enters the scene. And Jesus says, when the Samaritan saw the broken, beat up man, he had pity on him. He bandaged him, probably ripping his own clothes and bandaging the man, pouring on his wounds, oil to soothe and wine as an antiseptic. He put him on his own beast. He took him to an inn. He paid his fare. He stayed with the broken, beat man overnight. Now the question mark in the expert of the law's mind is, what? Did you just make a Samaritan the hero of the story? Who were Samaritans? Samaritans were enemies of the Jew. It's likely that the Jewish people hated the Samaritans even more than they hated Gentiles. The Samaritans were an interesting group of people historically. Actually, their roots come from Uh, That time in history, during Israel's history, when the ten northern tribes were taken into captivity in Assyria. And if you don't know anything about the uh, ancient Assyrians, you can read about them historically. They were one of the cruelest known people groups to ever walk the face of the earth. They used to literally kill their enemies, and they would take their skulls and stack their heads in a pyramid in front of the city, their capital city, which was Nineveh, of all places. You 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 wonder why Jonah didn't want to go there. So human skulls stacked, they used to skin their, um, their victims alive and make furniture out of them with their skin. They, they would literally put, put hooks in the jaws of their victims and drag them into captivity. I mean, you can read about some of the horrific things that wouldn't be proper to talk about on a Sunday morning that the, the Assyrians did. And so the Assyrians, when they took the Jews into captivity, the ten northern tribes, they then began to intermarry. And so the Samaritans were a people that were half-breed Jews. They were essentially the children born of Jewish moms impregnated by Assyrian men. It'd be the equivalent if if during the 1940s, the Holocaust, if, if there was a child born of a Jewish mom that was impregnated by a Nazi soldier. That wouldn't be a favored person because of the trauma associated with their conception. And, and so the Jews so hated the Samaritans that literally when they were traveling in the land, and if you look at a map, you can see if a Jew is traveling from north to south or south to north, the quickest route would be to go through Samaria. But no good Jew would ever travel through Samaria. They would literally go all the way around to not get the dust of that land on their feet. 
They hated the Samaritan. But Jesus didn't have such a bend towards the Samaritans. Actually, if you remember the story in John chapter 4, when Jesus has that interaction with the woman at Sychar, the woman in Samaria at the well, it says, John tells us about Jesus, he must go through Samaria. In other words, Jesus was saying, I love Samaritans. I have nothing against Samaritans. Actually, there was one point you might remember that the Jews were so angry at Jesus, they were looking at like an ancient way to trash talk him. In John chapter 8, verse 48, they said, you're a Samaritan and you have a demon. It's like, in Jesus' day, that was trash talk. You're a demon-possessed Samaritan, now deal with that. You know what's interesting about Jesus' response in John chapter 8? Jesus said, well, I don't have a demon. But he never said, and I'm not a Samaritan. Do we think Jesus was a Samaritan? Absolutely not. Not historically, but what Jesus was saying is, I don't mind being associated with them. Actually, a lot of people have interpreted the, the, the story of the Samaritan as actually Jesus telling a metaphor about himself, which is kind of interesting. Jesus was the good Samaritan, and I think you could make that parallel. But, but the Jews had this natural animosity towards the Samaritans, and Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. He's the one who gets it right. He's the one who loved the beat-up brother. He clothed the naked man. That thieves had stripped naked. He bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on his wounds. He carried him on his own donkey. He brought him to an inn. He spent the night with him taking care of this wounded man. He paid the innkeeper and said, I'm going away, but when I return, count up all the wages and I will pay you everything that this man owes. And this isn't just a story about love for a stranger. This is a story about lavish love for an enemy. You understand what's happening here? The Samaritan was hated by the Jew, therefore the Samaritan also hated the Jew. This beat up man was not a friend. This beat up man was probably a Jewish man who would be considered an enemy. And so now we get into this idea of what does it really mean to love my neighbor? It doesn't mean your neighbor. It means you be neighborly. You love whoever is beat up along the the roadside of life, whether they be friend or foe. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, when have I ever loved anybody like this besides myself? The only person I've gone to as much extreme pain to love in this way, the way the Samaritan loved this man, is myself, maybe my family, maybe a friend. But very few, uh, if any of us, have ever loved a stranger this way. Add on top of that, when was, the, when was the last time, if ever, you loved an enemy like this? You took care of an enemy this way? And someone would say, well, well Brian, I mean, it's possible. It has been done. I'm sure historically we could find some stories, and, and there have been stories of people that have done great acts of forgiveness. Women like Corey Tim Boone, who forgave that Nazi soldier who uh, basically caused her sister to die in the concentration camp. A great act, a beautiful act of forgiveness but, but, but really what Jesus is saying, it's not about that one time that you did that one great thing. It's about doing it every time with every person in every way at every chance you've ever gotten for your whole life. You have to have always loved your enemy perfectly if you want to inherit eternal life. Oh. Really? If you want eternal life, if you're reading this correctly, Jesus is saying, in order for you to have eternal life, you have had to live this out perfectly. And then Jesus turns and asks the man. After he tells the expert in the law the story, verse 36, this is kind of an interesting little interaction he has with him. He says, now which of the three was a neighbor to the wounded man? And the lawyer says, the one who showed him mercy. Can't even bring himself to say Samaritan. The one who showed him mercy. I don't even want to say. So, so what are we being confronted here with in this man? This man's being confronted with a couple of things. His prejudice and racism. And he's also being confronted with the fact that he thinks he's lived a life that he hasn't lived. And he tried to justify himself to convince himself and others that he was better than he knew he really was. And Jesus is saying, I'm about to throttle you with this story. I'm going to derail your self-righteousness. You're not okay. You do not 
You do not live in a way, even though you're an expert in Torah, even though you're a lawyer and you know the rabbinic laws and traditions, and you probably have kept them in, in some parameters, but I'm about to blow all boxes up and all parameters off and say, basically, if you haven't loved God perfectly and loved every person perfectly, you cannot have eternal life. And the story ends with Jesus interacting with the lawyer this way. Basically, the man says, I know who showed mercy and loved in a neighborly way, the way the Bible tells us to, this wounded man. And it was the Samaritan, the man who's not like me, the man whom I hate. And Jesus said, okay, you go. Then Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Sprout wings and fly to heaven. If that's how you want to get there. And he lets the man, for all intents and purposes, walk away. So different than our altar calls. We're like trying to persuade people and like, what could I say to make you want Jesus? What could I say to make you persuaded that this is a good thing? And and Jesus just says, if in the place in life you're at, you think you can do it on your own and you don't need me, then you can walk away in that. But walk away with the knowledge that the bar is set so high that you can't jump over it. That you aren't worth, you're not worthy of heaven. So what are we, brothers and sisters here who love Jesus, who have been saved by Jesus, what are we supposed to do with a story like this? Go try to live this way in order to get entrance into the kingdom of God? Should we go join Mother Teresa's Sisters of Charity? Should we go become monks and feed the poor? Should we sell everything we have and and give all our life and money and time to taking care of the broken and the downtrodden? Hey, that's a great idea right? If, if that's what God calls you to do. But we'd still be left, even if you were to do that, you'd still be left with the glaring reality that we haven't always loved this way. That we won't always love this way. Loving all people in every way in each circumstance. That actually we're incapable of such love towards our fellow man. And thus we're incapable of loving God the way we're supposed to. The way that Jesus said you must. And this was the lawyer's opportunity to cry out for mercy, to say, I admit it, I can't, I haven't, and I won't, I'm incapable, I need forgiveness, I need grace, I need mercy, and Jesus sets him up for this, and I want to leave us with a couple things as we head our way this morning and into some more worship, I want to leave us with a couple thoughts about Jesus' teachings in general and this teaching in particular as it concerns our understanding of what Jesus said. So just two things for you to process. If you walk away with anything um, this morning, hold on to these two things as it concerns the teachings of Jesus as we continue through the Gospel of Luke. First of all, as it concerns the teachings of Jesus, number one, encountering the real Jesus will shock you. Encountering, underline, real Jesus will shock you. Number two, encountering the real Jesus will will transform you. First of all, encountering the real Jesus will shock you. The experience that this expert in the law has with Jesus is anything but warm and fuzzy. Even though the story's been put across as a rather warm and fuzzy story about a nice Samaritan who helped a broken, beat up man. That wasn't the intent of the story. The real Jesus and his message should disturb you. And I think that you'll find in the message of Jesus a couple of things. First of all, you'll find that it demands more than you ever thought it would, and it offers more than you could have ever dreamed. Jesus' message demands more from you than you ever thought, and it promises more, it offers more than you could have ever dreamed. When you encounter the real Jesus, it should be one of two responses. Either bow down in wonder and submission, or go away offended. And both of those are appropriate responses. Do I get freaked out when people are offended by Jesus? No way. You should be, especially if you don't want him. You better be offended if you've met the real Jesus. The other response is the glorious one where someone bows down and says he's Lord. The one thing that cannot happen when a person confronts the real Jesus is indifference. 
Indifference is not allowed. And so someone, if someone is indifferent or looks at Christianity as ir- irrelevant or unimportant or just kind of silly, they haven't encountered the real Jesus. And our cultural idea of encountering the real Jesus, and so many people look at the real Jesus as, oh, you know, yeah, the real Jesus, he's good for holidays and tough times and Hallmark cards. You haven't encountered the real Jesus. The real Jesus will either cause you to bow or be absolutely disturbed and offended. And offended. Did I say defended? I meant offended. Jesus should disturb us. In the words of Tumnus the Fawn, he's a lion. He's not a tame lion, but he is good. Jesus is offensive on purpose. He's either Lord or he's greatly offensive. So encountering, first of all, the teachings and person of the real Jesus in the Gospels and in this story in particular should either shock you or cause you to worship. But encountering him will create some dramatic effect when you encounter the real Jesus. Number two, and finally, encountering the real Jesus will transform you. I think we could all agree that we're weak in our love for God and our neighbor. If we're humble here today and we're actually rightly evaluating ourselves, we don't love God or, or each other or people the way we ought to, the way that the Bible requires that we should. But I would say this. Though this story is a story that we can't live by, I do believe that Jesus still wants to live his life through you to love the broken man. Even though we can't perfectly in every way, Jesus still desires that through your life he would love the broken and wounded man. One British preacher named Alexander McLaren from the 1800s wrote this, the world would be a changed place if every Christian attended to the sorrows that are plain before him. And so where this kind of love for God or our fellow man does not exist within us, we are not going to receive this by our own efforts. But instead, rather, we ought to trust Jesus to impart his life through us that we might live this way. That's the transforming work of the gospel, of the news that Jesus has come to rule and reign in our lives. It's what the Bible calls regeneration. Basically, regeneration is a word, biblical word that just means God gives you a new heart. He changes you from the inside outward. One of the most important passages as it concerns what it means to be a follower of Jesus is Ezekiel chapter 36, 26, and 27. Jot this one down. So Ezekiel, the prophet, says this, A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away a stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So, so listen, brothers and sisters, you hear what, 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 what the prophet just said? The, the new covenant, what God wants to do is take out the old stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh, a heart that Jesus can work in. So Christianity isn't reforming your character. It isn't character modification. It is life transformation. Christianity is an absolute heart transplant. And when you get a new heart, what comes with your new heart is a new identity. What comes with your new heart is a new Lord. What comes with your new heart is a new community. What comes with your new heart is a new power. What comes with your new heart is new desires. When I became a Christian, I was 17 years of age. You know what I wanted at 17 years of age? All kinds of wickedness. I did not want the Bible. I did, want, not, did not want to be hanging out with church folks, singing church songs in a really clean, sterile environment. Not at 17, man. At 17, I was like, woo, that's party. But Jesus changed my heart. He took out the stony heart and put in a new heart. And all of a sudden, it was the weirdest thing. I'm still 17. I'm still a normal, hormonal adolescent. But I, just, I want the Bible. And my pastor's teaching out of King James. And I want that. I'm showing up for it early. I'm coming early in the morning to listen to a man sing and praise God at 6.30 a.m. at 17 years of age, driving 30 minutes in my old Chevy Impala gas hog. We called it La Bamba. It was all primer, <laughs> little low rider wheels and a small steering wheel with a little dingle balls hanging around there, you know, the little chili pepper lights, and I was listening to Marvin Gaye, 
That was me in the 90s. I'm rolling out in La Bamba for 30 minutes to go to early morning worship to listen to a guy that sang with the craziest vibrato voice I've ever heard. I was listening to like Tupac, and now I chuck all that. I'm listening to Keith Green and going to morning worship at 6.30 a.m. Why? You don't produce that by any other way than Jesus take out a stony heart and put in a new heart. I, 17, Brian Fowler, no one's, can, my youth pastors, as cool as they were, could not convince me to walk in that way. Do you know what happened? No one had to tell me, read the Bible, be around the people of God, worship God, love God, go early morning, worship God. I wanted to do that. And I, I wasn't cognitive of it at the time, but stepping back, I'm like, what happened to me? Like, I literally had like this transformation, and many of you can say the same thing. That's what Christianity is. It isn't behavior modification. Let's get rid of that idea of that's what Christianity is. White knuckle yourself through this thing. Sanctification by strangulation. Man, whatever your desires are, choke them out. Make them tap. Rear naked choke, man. MMA style. Tap, flesh. And that most people let their Christianity like that. I want to lust. I want to drink. I want to eat too much. I want to be lazy. I want to curse. I want to watch this. I want to do that. And then we're like, yeah, yeah, behavior modification, bro. You need to be sanctified. Choke that out. You know what happens? You create, you create two extremes, or actually three extremes in a person who tries sanctification by strangulation. You either, com- you either create a legalist who thinks they're better than everyone else because they're more disciplined, and their military style, this full-on Navy SEAL style, props to Winston, right? Able to make themselves obey by discipline. Or you create the opposite effect, someone who tries and fails. And then in the middle, someone just says, I quit can't be a Christian. Ain't good enough. I tried it. Ten years, had a good record, had some slip-ups. Cannot be what I'm supposed to be if that's what God requires. Amen. That's, that's, that's the gospel. Christianity isn't behavior modification. It's heart transformation. It's a transplant. That is, God has given you new desires. I call them deeper desires. And this is how it rolls for me. Deeper desires versus lesser desires. The war within. There's, there's these new desires that I have for Jesus, but there's also my old desires. That, that old dog still lives. Bad dog, good dog fight, right? And I'm in a dog fight. I have these deeper desires now with my new heart, but I still have those lesser desires. Like, for instance, this is, this is the battle I go through. You think me carnal, but forgive me, or let me talk to you afterwards. But um, I have this commute that I have to make um, from Cary where the office is, to my home in Southeast Raleigh. And I'm usually coming home around dinner time. And I know, waiting me at my house, is a beautiful woman, Shannon, of 16 years now. Um, four great kids, most of the time. Um, and I have a, I'm, I'm going to my house in th- Southeast Raleigh, but I have to drive by Temptation. Chipotle. <laughs> Chick-fil-A. <sighs> cookout. Probably really, you know, that's probably the worst of the temptations I'm driving past. Burger King right on the corner by my house. And by that time, I'm hungry, right? I know my wife's going to make dinner. What's my, what is my lesser desire on my way home? I'm pulling the Chick-fil-A, getting a spicy chicken sandwich, right, deluxe. I'm going to get some of those waffle cut fries and a Coke Zero with a lime in it. Oh, oh, oh. yes, that sounds good right now, Right? That's my lesser desire. You know what my greater desire is? Sit home and eat with my family a healthy meal. But you know, a lot of us are trying to fight our temptation towards Chick-fil-A. By saying, don't go to Chick-fil-A, don't go to Chick-fil-A, don't go to Chick-fil-A. And we're trying to starve ourselves. Rather than saying, no, rather than trying to resist Chick-fil-A, I'm just going to pursue my wife and kids in a home-cooked meal. I'm going to pursue my deeper desires because I promise you this, your deeper desires are stronger. At the bottom, your deepest desire, who you really want to be if you're in Jesus, is actually the strongest desire you have. You really do want to read your Bible and not watch more TV, even though you don't think so. You really do want to be kind. You really do want to walk in sanctification. Your lesser desire, your top desire, the one that, the well-worn path that you're used to is pulling into Chick-fil-A. But I want to suggest to you something. Rather than beat yourself up and always try to fight against your lesser desires, Why not just pursue the deeper desire? And I'm saying even if you blew it. 
even if you came in here today a wreck, you're like, Brian, I didn't want to come here this morning. You don't know the things that I've done and said and been. I've been a rotten fool. I am so far off my game. I haven't loved my neighbor like I'm supposed to. I haven't loved God like I'm supposed to. I'd say, you're here now. Pursue your deeper desires. You keep pursuing your deeper desires, and they will become so strong that it won't be any more sanctification by strangulation. It won't be any more of this trying to white-knuckle it through life and say, don't sin, don't sin. You say, I'm pursuing God. And in pursuing God, something changes. And, and I really believe that the Lord, as we does not deny our lesser desires and pursue our deeper desires, will make us like this Samaritan who helps the beat-up brother, whether he be a friend or an enemy, that Jesus really wants to fulfill the law in and through you. So my simple exhortation and calling to us today is begin living your life out of the heart that Jesus gave you. Acknowledge you have lesser desires. You are in a dogfight, brothers and sisters. But don't let that distract you from the fact you also have a deeper desire. There's also a different story being told about you. You want what God wants. You really do. And, and just recognize that. Say, you know, I really do want to walk holy. I, I really do want to be like Jesus, even though sometimes my lesser, lesser desires win. You start living out of that heart that Jesus gave you and watch how he's going to live his law, uh, live his life through yours and your appetite for lesser things will begin to change. I want to finish with this quote by C.S. Lewis, but before I, 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 quote, I, I share this quote with you, I just want to say this. I think a lot of times um, people step into Christianity and they have this image that they're following this very mellow rabbi who wore a dress and drank herbal tea and had long hair, and, and that Christianity is sort of like an emasculated version of life. And that, that to step into being a Christian, all of a sudden you lose all your passions. I, I, you know, Christians are, seem to be kind of non-passionate people. And, and yet I would say just the opposite. I would say you actually haven't really begun to have strong desire until you become a Christian. Um, you are living in some other world, but, but real strong desire. Becoming a Christian is, is not about abandoning strong desire. It's about stepping into a, a time of real desire. And so C.S. Lewis said this about Christianity. He, he said, it's not that our passions are too strong, they are too weak. Have you ever thought your passions are too strong? It's not, not, that's not true. Your passions are too weak. We are, listen to this, this is a, important, we are far too easily satisfied with lesser things. That is, you would settle for lust. And God's saying, if you had really strong desires... You, you would go past that. We desire explosive anger. But if you were really walking and pursuing God, you would desire past that. And actually, brothers and sisters, I can confidently assert to you today, if you have been changed by Jesus and given a new heart, your desires for him are even stronger than you have ever imagined. And so today we get to not walk in the way of this religious expert this legal expert, this man who thought he had it, but we get to walk in the way of humble servants of God who say, change my heart, God, and let me live out of the heart that you've given me. Amen?